to the Yucca Flats, Nevada, where KTLA's cameras are stationed atop 9,000-foot Mount Charleston, ready to bring you complete coverage of the Nevada A-bomb test. We are now going to uh, use another type filter on another camera. This one is not as dense as the other, so you'll get an entirely different comparison as uh, this particular lens is pointed up to the sun. Our cameraman, Robin Clark, is uh, applying the uh, filter to the front of the Zoomar lens. On this camera here, still pointing at the sun, is Galen Westfall. That was a quick take. <laughs> That, of course, is the famous Zoomar that uh, Robin Clark is working on, Gil. And as I understand, that is from 8 to 22 inches, the, um, that particular camera right there, so they can really zoom in a great distance. Now, this is a different type uh, filter, and as we said, it isn't quite as dense. Is that correct? That's in, right. In the rays. Mm -hmm. We are now showing you the severe filter. Robin is uh, locating the sun with the less dense filter. I might say this is quite, a, quite an accomplishment here. These boys have to practically get down on their knees and point it. Well, these are the last of the tests, Gil, uh, in preparatory for the actual atom blast. And so we will uh, have the proper filters on at the proper time. And of course, with that 40-inch lens, we'll bring the atom blast very, very close to our KTLA cameras. The use of these filters is playing a very important part in today's atomic blast. Uh, Mr. Landsberg has spent a great deal of time in ascertaining the correct densities of these filters to make sure that nothing is lost. It may require a particular uh, density of filter at one point, a lighter the next, and then as the bomb uh, presumably rises to a point where the intense fire and heat has dissipated itself somewhat, then there will be no filters used and you will get the full clarity and impact of the uh, bomb's shape and size. All right, our cameras are all set up now. The filters are ready. I feel an air of tenseness, and I think everyone else does around here. I'm watching my watch now, just about 30 seconds. Five seconds. In five seconds, I'm going to count. One, two, three, Four, five. That should be bombs away. And now for the 36 second long count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. What do you know, then? There it is, that brilliant flash, that white light that precedes the explosion of the atomic bomb number 17. Forty miles away, a brilliant white flash, almost blinding with those rocket trails coming out of it. The fire is dying now. It's turning to a dull red, not quite the brilliant orange and purple and green of past atomic bombs, but a beautiful sight. The typical funnel shape rising into that giant mushroom cloud and now blossoming out like a big ball of cotton. An amazing sight, even from 40 miles away here as I adjust my glasses. It's taking on now a purplish hue as I'm bringing it into focus. There's still fire in the top of it, that Dante Inferno red that I described before. And now the purple tinges are coming up. But this, ah, this is different. This is not the typical giant mushroom shape of atomic bombs before. It has a typical mushroom shape, slightly, uh, doubling into a broader base and then narrowing down into that shock sandblast that is typical of all atomic bombs. This bomb is not mushrooming as did the former ones, the one on April the 22nd. However, from where we stand here, 40 miles away, it does look as though it is more intense. There seems to be more fire, more power in this particular bomb. Let me adjust my glasses again. Stan, can you hold this yes, microphone? Yes. And now it's beginning to uh, go into a totem pole effect. Again, losing that mushroom effect quicker this time than it has ever before. This is more like a spouting geyser, a giant jet of water shooting up into the sky, but still retaining those... 
beautiful colors of purple, white, and mostly gray now as I see them through my glasses. I can't see it through uh, the naked eye. It's almost lost, but I go back to my glasses, and I'm still able to appreciate the beautiful colors. We did not... And now let me take you down to the base of the, uh, of the explosion. Here we see a typical sign of the shock waves that have spewed out the sand. And uh, this is the fire smoke rising, uh, thick at the bottom, narrowing somewhat, narrowing again, and then blossoming out to another width, and then up into a disjointed mushroom. And now here comes the full effect of the mushroom, and I wouldn't be surprised if in just a few seconds we do get the shock wave and the heat. I presume uh, that it would have come earlier, but we have not felt it up here at a 9,000 foot altitude, and that's possible uh, because the bomb uh, might have been exploded at a lower altitude and been absorbed by the nearby mountains. It is still a gorgeous sight, a frightening sight, a sight that one should never forget. We are indeed happy to be able to bring it to you on your television screens today in its full glory. And to stand here this morning some 9,000 feet above Yucca Flats, wherein we witness the explosion of this 17th atomic bomb, it's almost like standing in reverence and awe of a scientific phenomenon, a combination of man-made metal and scientific endeavor. Plutonium, the man-made metal combined with Mother Nature's gift to the atomic bomb, uranium-235. A now inspiring sight and a fearsome sight. We see now the vast top cloud disintegrating, taking on another shape, and following down this giant stalk, sort of like a jack and the beanstalk, we see the slowly changing colors again from the brilliant white of the top cloud to the darker shades, the lighter gray, and then down to that voluminous column of sand spout. That's the sand that rises from the desert at the percussion of the bomb. The sand that gives way and rises up in protest of being disturbed by this animal of science unleashed in all its mad fury. Some of that fury is gone now as we see it. The clouds taking on an umbrella shape, sort of like a claw shape and dismembering itself. Like the child of mother is now on its own. This is the cloud that will disintegrate, go along with other clouds to form perhaps the cumulus clouds to the untrained observer in other states over which it passes. And this is also the cloud which will be tracked by the cloud trackers to determine the amount of yield, as they say in atomic energy parlance, the amount of intensity of the bomb. There again, we're focusing our cameras on that vast sand cloud, which is still reluctant to go back to its uh, former place of rest. A beautiful sight. We are indeed fortunate, even though it is as fearsome as I've described it, and as fearsome as we see it here. And too, we are, been, uh, have been privileged to see this this morning as we stand here in this vantage point some 40 miles away. As I mentioned earlier, this bomb seems to have been the most powerful of the three or four that I've witnessed. Stan Chambers is here beside me now, and Stan hasn't seen one before. Stan, by the way, what is your reaction to this sight? It's a tremendous thing, Gil, that huge ball of fire on that, uh, almost the horizon there, and jumping up in that tremendous mushroom cloud. It, it really scares you. I, I have a lot of respect for that bomb, even from 40 miles. I think to stand here, uh, words almost uh, fail to describe what we see, and it is with the most inadequate words that we pay tribute to this fearsome creature that we sincerely hope will be used only in a peaceful effort and not in uh, other ways.